In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Joseph, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So we're back for another class. Just like I told you, I'm going to do two classes now on the main two divisions of the liturgical year, the cycle of time and the cycle of the saints. Today we're going to focus on the cycle of time. Now it's going to be a long class. I know that I try to, I could try to keep my video short, but it's not going to happen today. It's going to be a long one, but it's also going to be a really good one because we're going to learn everything about the liturgical year. Good, so let's begin. So I have my handy dandy PowerPoint presentation in front of us. Um, the liturgical year, the cycle of time. So some general information to begin. So as I just said, the liturgical year runs on two calendars, the cycle of time and the cycle of the saints. Today we're focusing on the cycle of time. And that runs from the first Sunday of Advent to the last Sunday of Pentecost. Usually that is late November to late November of the next year. Now, depending on which hand missile you're using or which book you're reading, sometimes this cycle of time is called by slightly different names. So it can also be called the cycle of mysteries, the temporal cycle, or the seasonal cycle. Those all mean the same thing. They all mean those uh, that succession of seasons and days and feasts and fasts that focus on the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. In your missile, your hand missile, this cycle is found under the section which is entitled Proper of the season. Not proper of the saints, proper of the season. So your first question perhaps is this, why does the cycle of time vary every year? You know, for example, it doesn't work like that with the calendar year, January 1st, December 31st, the beginning and the end. That's just how it is. Why is it different for the church calendar? Well, because the cycle of time is all based on Easter. And Easter is the center of the liturgical year. Always remember that. Now, Easter itself is determined by the year's lunar and solar calendar. And when you start to put, uh, put that into the equation, each year it's going to be slightly different. So that's the reason why the cycle of time varies each year. Now I've made a handy dandy diagram thing list of all of the church seasons as found in the traditional calendar. Let's go through them. I tried to make it as simple as possible, but okay, first no, I have a little I have a little note on the screen right here. Note on strict unclass and classifiability. That basically means we can try to classify them perfectly, but it's not really possible because these seasons of the year grew like had a very organic development through centuries of the uh, centuries of the church. And it's hard to really define things clearly when they've had that organic development. So anyway, let's just go through this really quickly. You have Advent, and then you have Christmas tide and Epiphany tide. Septuagesima, then you have Lent, Passion Tide, the Holy Triduum, then Easter Tide, Ascension Tide, Whitsun Tide, and then Time After Pentecost. So, I put a little, uh, some special notes in here. So Septuagesima and Whitsun Tide, the font is colored brown, and that's because those two seasons exists in the traditional calendar, but they no longer exist in the new calendar. 
So that's important to keep in mind. And furthermore, the brackets that I put around some of these seasons means that um, all the seasons in those brackets, they're kind of, in a sense, like conglomerous. You can count them as one season if you want. You can count, for example, the Epiphany Tide as a sub-season of Christmas Tide. But I'm just trying to be as specific as possible in this video. So, next slide. The cycle of time follows the birth of our Lord until the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the Apostles. So it begins with Advent, goes to Pentecost, and then the time after that continu continuing on. But it's important to know that mystically, this cycle of time represents the beginning of time until the end of time. That's how expansive it is. So Advent is not only doesn't only signify, you know, like the few months before our Lord was born, the time from the Annunciation onwards. Really, it holds in it like all the, the cries and moans and longings of all the prophets and people from the beginning of the world who wanted to see the Redeemer. And then conversely, at, at the end, the time after Pentecost, that really includes this current time now. The Holy Ghost, the, the Holy Ghost came at Pentecost and he continues his, his work even now until the end of time. Now we can go through the individual seasons one by one. I'll try to be as clear as possible here. So, Advent first. Advent usually lasts from the last Sunday of November and always until December 25th. It is a time of longing for the coming of the Redeemer. So it's a penitential season. It's a se season of supplication. It's a season of desire. Really, it's kind of a season even of excitement because we still sing the word Alleluia in the sort of excitement for the coming of the Savior on December 25th. But let us always remember that Advent is a time of penance. And I know that can be difficult to live if one follows the secular um, mindset of the Christmas season, which places all the festivities before Christmas. So that can be uh, a problem to, the, our, to our faith, trying to live out penance as Catholics. Anyway. Advent reminds us of the three comings of Christ. So this is kind of a mystical thing. So first, he has earthly incarnation. Second, his birth into our souls, because he came into our souls and we were baptized, right? And thirdly, his coming at the end of the world. That third one's important because on the first Sunday of Advent, what gospel do we read? It's not the gospel of the Annunciation, but it's the gospel of the last judgment, our Lord describing the last judgment. Wow, what a, way, what a way to begin the whole liturgical year with the end of it. Because it reminds us that Christ is going to come again. How epic is that? Now the readings in Advent revolve around the prophecy, prophecy of Isaiah. He said, for example, he says, the vir a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Again, the Gospels on Sunday revolve around John the Baptist because he is the immediate um, uh, predecessor of our Lord. And if you look closely during the Ember Days, um, we see the account of the Annunciation of the angel Gabriel to Our Lady because that's the immediate immediate historical context before our Lord's birth. Violet vestments are worn during 
the masses of Advent. And violet represents penance and humility. So whenever you walk into mass and the priest is wearing violet, you should think, oh wait, this is some penitential mass. We have to have, I have to have the spirit of penance and humility at this mass. During Advent, further, the Gloria is not sung at masses of the season, nor is the organ played. And the reason for that is because the Gloria is a hymn of, it's like a hymn, hymn of jubilation and a, a great and happy hymn of praise. So it's never sung or recited during penitential seasons. And same with the organ. The organ is like this this uh, beautiful ornament to the Mass. And when it's time for penance, you don't have ornaments in church. It's more plain and more simple. So that's Advent. Next, Christmas time. Now, I place Epiphany Tide as a sort of sub season of Christmas Tide because too much to go into, but that's what I did. It's probably easier to imagine it like that instead of it being a separate season. So, if, if you, you want, want to be strict, strict about it, this is the big, big question. When does Christmas end? If you, if you want, want to be strict, then Christmas Tide ends on January 14th. Because Christmas Tide lasts until January 6th. That's the Feast of the Epiphany in the traditional calendar. So then it's Epiphany Tide until January 14th. And after that, technically speaking, Christmas Tide has ended, though it is a common custom to observe it until February 2nd. Now, the spirit of Christmas. It's important for us to remember the spirit of Christmas because, like I said, with the secularization of Christmas, it's been completely lost upon us. So, this is it. Basically, after weeks of doing penance during Advent, Christ has born again into our hearts. We become more like him. That's very important. Remember, the perfection of religion is to imitate whom you adore. So the, the, the liturgical year tries, really, in the end, to make us more like Christ. That's what all the seasons try to do in their own way. To imitate our Lord. Christmas is also a time of gratitude because Christ appeared appeared to the Gentiles, to the three wise men. And we can include ourselves amongst them. We would have had never known Christ. We would have been completely lost had not he appeared to us in his mercy. And we should also seek after the Lord like the Magi did, even going far to seek him. Now further, the Christmas and Epiphany season focuses on, first of all, the fact that God has become man and taken on flesh. So first of all, we have his nativity. He's a, a child in the crib. You can see him, you can hear him, you can touch him. Then we have his circumcision on January 1st, which is quite Physical is a not because God took on human flesh, became a man. And then uh, the next, uh, is it the next day? Right after that, you have the feast of the holy name of Jesus. Because when we say the name of Jesus, we think of the perfect God and perfect man. Then the season focuses also on the many appearances of this God-man. So at his nativity, he appeared to um, the shepherds. At his epiphany, he appeared to the wise men. At his baptism, that's uh, January um, 13th, he appeared. He appeared before men as the son of the beloved uh, of his father, baptized in the Jordan. And then also the second Sunday of Epiphany. After uh, second Sunday after Epiphany, we. Read the Gospel of the Wedding Feast at Cana, when Christ did his first public miracle. And then lastly, the Christmas season focuses on the Divine Motherhood of Mary.
that's on January 1st. Because you can't say Jesus is born without somehow referencing Mary in that. So she's intrinsically part of the Christmas season. During Christmas time and Epiphany time, white vestments are worn. White always represents joy and purity of soul. There are further six Sundays after the Epiphany maximum. Sometimes there are less, depending on the year. But there can be six Sundays after the Epiphany. Now, green vestments are worn for these from January 14th onwards. Let's move on now to the third season or fourth season, Septuagesima. What a difficult name to pronounce. Well, the word Septuagesima basically means the 70th. And this is in reference to it being a roughly 70 day countdown to Easter. After um, Septuagesima follow Sexagesima, which means 60th, and then Quinquagesima, which means 50th. Now, these Sundays, included in the season of Septuagesima, only exist in the traditional calendar, as I said. In the new calendar, this time would be ordinary time. Now, the 70th. It's not exa Septuagesima seven, uh, Sunday is not exactly 70 days until Easter. It's usually it's actually closer to 60. Consider this time then a really long vigil for the biggest feast of the year. So the solemnity of the feast demands a solemn vigil as well. Easter, because it's such a great time, demands a super long vigil of more than 60 days. And during Septuagesima, we're supposed to detach ourselves from the joys of Christmas and withdraw from um, worldly things more than ever and begin to do penance. A, a big part of Septuagesima is that the word Alleluia is no longer said. This begins like a stripping down of the Mass, which will happen more and more until the Holy Triduum itself. Everything glorious is taken out of the Mass little by little. So the word Alleluia, which means praise be to God, is taken out from Septuagesima. We don't say it anymore from that Sunday until Easter happens. And then again, Septuagesima, violet vestments are used from then on until Easter Sunday mostly. And then no more Gloria on Sundays from Septuagesima onwards. Then Septuagesima seg segues into the season of Lent. And as we all know, Lent begins on Ash Wednesday. The Sunday following Ash Wednesday is called Quadragesima Sunday, which means the 40th. This is a really important time of the year, the most solemn penitential time of the whole year. 40. In the Bible, 40 is used often to represent suffering, affliction, humiliation. So the Israelites wandered in the desert for 40 years. The flood of, uh, during Noah's time happened for 40 days. Moses and Elijah fasted for 40 days. Our Lord was in the desert for 40 days. It's not exactly a number that represents like feasting and partying. It's the complete opposite. So Lent is a time of serious prayer. And I even took the time to italicize that word serious because we should take Lent really seriously. It's a time of serious prayer, fasting and almsgiving and reparation for our sins. Now, from Ash Wednesday onwards, the organ is no longer played at Mass. Uh, then there's more kneeling as well. We have to kneel for more prayers uh, during the Mass and a violet is still worn. The Masses during Lent 
are some of the nicest and most beautiful masses of the whole year because the, the text of the masses, like the epistles and gospels, they are very, very old and they express some beautiful things. Their main theme is sorrow and begging for the mercy of the Lord. They also speak about the, grow, uh, the growing hatred of our Lord's enemies for him. And this is more of a historical um, nugget. They, the epistles and gospels for these masses especially were made for the catechumens in the early church and the public penitents in the early church because they would for, so for the catechumen catechumens that's a difficult word to say catechumens during Lent that would be their preparation you know kind of their final initiation before the baptism during the Easter vigil for the penitents it would be their time of you know doing public penance before they're reconciled to the church I believe on Holy Thursday so the lessons of the masses the gospels and epistles sometimes speak have to do with baptism and repentance so for example we read about naaman the leper who was cleansed by washing himself like we read of, what does that have to do with lent what well, has to do with the catechumens that would have heard this epistle in the seventh century or whatever and they would have said oh this is what the baptism does it cleanses me of my sins so that's really those ain't those readings for lent are really old and beautiful now passion time after six weeks uh, after five full weeks of lent it becomes particularized it becomes passion time so the sixth sunday of lent is uh, is that right fifth or sixth or one of those two it's passion time and passion time lasts two weeks nearly two weeks basically until wednesday of holy week you could also say it lasts all the way until holy saturday um, it's, but i'm just using this method instead because i'm going to make a division in the next slide passion tide really in, during passion tide we focus completely on our lord's upcoming passion and death and especially on the wicked plans that his enemies um, were making against them if you read the the, uh, the text of the masses closely it really speaks about these two things and again further reductions are made to the mass no more gloria patri because even that when you think about it is a joyful thing a prayer of jubilation glory to the father to the son and to the holy ghost so it's taken out of the mass again the prayers at the foot of the altar are taken out of mass as well and further the statues and images in the church are uh, veiled in violet so it's a very very it's just getting more solemn until we come to the three most solemn days of the year the holy triduum while it's not really a season it is a time that's set aside um, that's just really unique in the whole year because everything is so different holy thursday good friday and holy saturday so again we continue with the restriction uh the reductions of the mass that started during septuagesima and even it's even happening with the mass itself so for example no mass is allowed to be celebrated on good friday and holy saturday until the easter vigil so we priests don't even celebrate mass on those days even we lose something there and that's because it really is focusing on our lord's passion and death taking away everything so our minds are just focused on that really if there are three days that you should give yourself entirely to the liturgical year three days that you should take off of a work besides all the days of obligation they are these days one could write books and books 
on the spirit and liturgies during these three days. So that's the Holy Triduum. And now we've come to the greatest feast day of the whole year, Easter. This is called the Solemnity of Solemnities, and it begins Easter time. So <clears throat> the Easter season, also called Paschal time, lasts from Easter Sunday until the day before Trinity Sunday. So that's eight weeks long. In the new calendar, it's seven weeks long. We'll see why that is in a minute. Uh, Ascension Tide and Whitsuntide are part of, part of the Easter season as well. You might call them a subdivision of the Easter season. But uh, the liturgy does still distinguish between Ascension Tide and Whitsuntide. Whitsuntide means Pentecost time. So make a note here that we spend just as much time celebrating Easter as we spend preparing for Easter, about 60 days for each of them. So the church is wise. She imposes a strict penance on us for sure. But she also grants us a solemn feast. Let us always remember that when Lent is over and Easter begins, it's not the time to give up our good spiritual life that we've made during Lent. It's not the time to stop going to Mass, to take back all the worldly things that we gave up during Lent. No, it's time to continue doing those things. We should have a little, some reprieve um, when it comes to, you know, being able to eat more. But when it comes to worldly things, we should never go back to those because our Lord himself wants to take us away from the world. So it shouldn't be just 40 days away from worldly things. It should be anything that's sinful and worldly, we should try to give up forever. During Easter, we, Easter, the octave especially, we have probably the most beautiful masses of the whole year. They're just so gorgeous. And... Um, yeah, we have a, I hope, at a homeschool camp um, every every year uh, during Easter week. And it's so nice because we get to have a sung mass every day for the Easter octave. And it's just so nice. The chapel is beautiful. And it really makes the whole camp to be able to live the liturgical life fully. So let's go through each of these seasons. Easter time itself. So Easter tide lasts from Easter Sunday to Ascension Thursday, 40 days. The color white is worn, and the message of Easter is this. It's like a new creation, as most especially in our souls. We, we put off the old man. We remember we worked on that during Lent. During Easter, we put on the new man. We're more spiritual than ever before. If you be risen with Christ, seek the things that are above. That's what we must do. So again, the perfection of religion is, it is to imitate whom you adore. We're always working on becoming more like Christ. During Easter, we should have a spiritual joy. And I took the time to italicize the word spiritual because that's really important. It's not a joy in worldly things. It's not a joy in sin. It's not a joy in selfishness or self-love. This is a spiritual joy. A taking pleasure in the things of God. The Easter octave. I just talked about that. Anyway, we'll continue on. The picture in the background... It's one of my favorite pictures. Um, it's um, Christ and uh, at the uh, at the tomb on Sun uh, Mary Magdalene at the tomb on Sunday morning when our Lord appeared to her under the guise of a gardener. Then we have the season, or might might you call it sub season of Ascension time, and this lasts from Ascension Thursday to Pentecost Sunday. It's a short season, ten days long really is kind of more of a preparation for Pentecost 
because as soon as Christ ascends to heaven, the focus is on praying for the coming of the Holy Ghost. The message during Ascension Tide is to follow Christ into heaven spiritually by dwelling on heavenly things. So remember, remember, this is interesting. The liturgy is never about you know, going back to worldly things or going back to your old self. It's always about becoming a new man in Christ and growing closer to him. White is worn during Ascension Tide still. Now, Ascension Tide leads us into Whitsuntide, also known as Pentecost Tide. Now, Pentecost, the time of Pentecost lasts eight days. It lasts from the Vigil of Pentecost until the following Saturday. This is called the Octave of Pentecost. And this octave only exists in the traditional calendar. That's why I said in, in the traditional calendar, Easter is eight weeks long. Whereas in the new calendar, it's seven weeks because they don't have that extra week that's added after the Feast of Pentecost. The theme of Pentecost is becoming more docile to the Holy Spirit so that he can, again, make us more Christ-like. The Mass propers for the Octave of Pentecost, which are proper almost every day, they are exceeding beautiful. Some of the nicest of the whole year. The Epistles are largely taken from the Acts of the Apostles and the Gospels from that of St. Luke and St. John. Now here's another historical nugget for you. If you look at the, the Mass Propers during the Octave of Pentecost, a theme that runs in them is baptism. Why is this? Well, because in the early church, the catechumens who couldn't be baptized on uh, during the Easter Vigil were baptized on the Vigil of Pentecost. So it's kind of like a second Easter in a way. Now, during Whitsuntide, red is worn to signify the fire of the Holy Spirit's divine love. How nice is that? Finally, we come to our last season, the time after Pentecost. So in the new calendar, this is called ordinary time. In the, in the traditional calendar, it's called time after Pentecost. This is the longest season of the whole year. It begins on Trinity Sunday and it runs 24 weeks minimum, 20, 28 weeks maximum. During that time, we wear green because green signifies hope and eternal rest. Now, the Sundays of after Pentecost should be seen as really a continuation of Pentecost, like the Holy Spirit came down then, and from then on, he's been working in the world, working in us, working until the end of time. So this season and also the season, the time after the Epiphany are known as a time of pilgrimage. That's why I put a little pic picture of people taking a pilgrimage to a church because it's kind of us um, just kind of just trying to hike through this life and become holy and get to heaven. And the whole year finishes, the last Sunday after Pentecost, finishes with the gospel of the last judgment, which signifies the end of time. How nice is that? So that's um, an in-depth summary of the cycle of time. There are a few more things that we can say here, but I'm going to try to address them in, in future videos, such as the Ember Days. We can talk about that later. Anyway, next video, we'll speak about the cycle of the saints. Anyway, God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.